Hello, and thank you for listening to my virtual presentation on step-by-step -step guidance on conducting prospective meta-analyses. My name is Anna-Lena Seidler, and I work at the NHMRC Clinical Trial Center at the University of Sydney in Australia. I'm also a member of the PMA Methods Group, which could be perceived as a potential conflict of interest. I don't think I have to convince anyone attending this Cochrane Colloquium that systematic reviews and meta-analyses are amazing. They are widely used to inform practice and they are often regarded as the top of the evidence hierarchy. And yet, there are some, several limitations and potential sources of bias to them. Firstly, there are publication and selective reporting bias. They describe the phenomenon that positive results are more likely to be published and thus included in systematic reviews. Additionally, most systematic reviewers know which studies are out there and what their results are, and this knowledge may affect the meta-analysis results. This can be illustrated using the example of Julie's daughter, who knew that she had failed history when she decided to exclude humanities from her evidence synthesis and thus concluded that she was a straight A student. Another problem associated with traditional meta-analyses is that often we are trying to compare pears with apples. Studies may have been conducted in different populations or collected different outcomes, which can make their synthesis difficult and sometimes even impossible. Luckily, there is a solution out there. Prospective meta-analyses, or short, PMA. And if you need more convincing that now is the time to learn about PMA, even eminent Ioannidis describes them as next generation systematic reviews and suggests that all primary research should be designed as prospective meta-analyses. So, what is a prospective meta-analysis? In a PMA, studies are included before their results are known. So, in this example below, the three studies need to be included in the PMA before their analysis. In a recent scoping review, we found that the number of PMA is increasing and that they are used across different areas of health research. However, we also found that the definition, methodology and reporting of previous PMA varied greatly. For this reason, we have written a step-by-step -step guide on how to conduct prospective meta-analysis, which has been published in the BMJ a few weeks ago. And I will now walk you through each of these steps um, with a particular focus on steps that are different to traditional retrospective meta-analysis. So before starting the PMA process, a decision needs to be made on whether PMA is the right methodology for the question at hand. Generally, PMA should be considered for high-priority research questions, for which limited previous evidence exists, and for which new studies are expected to emerge. This does not need to be a passive process, but instead can be an active catalyst for a joint program of priority research to be undertaken by a group of researchers. Once a decision has been made to conduct a PMA, a research question needs to be defined and a protocol needs to be written. Importantly, this needs, to be ha this needs to happen before any results related to the PMA research question are known to avoid um, pu publication and outcome selection bias. PMA can include interventional or observational studies and they can include individual participant or aggregate data. There are some key additional items that need to be covered in a PMA protocol, um, including search methods for plant and ongoing studies, and core outcomes to be measured by all studies. Um, similar to a traditional meta-analysis, a good PMA should be preceded by a search. However, since studies are planned or ongoing, um, the search can be a little more difficult. Studies for inclusion in a PMA can be identified by searching for trial registration records, protocols and cohort descriptions, and by actively approaching relevant stakeholders in the field. PMA can also motivate other research in the field to conduct a similar study, so the search can be more active. As a next step, a collaboration of study investigators is formed. 
The near-prom and epoch collaboration shown here are good examples that prospective meta-analyses involve people and not just papers. This collaboration can then work together to harmonize their studies, or in other words, to turn pears and apples into just apples. Harmonization involves that study authors agree on common design features of their studies, including the collection of common core outcomes that are measured with the same instruments and at the same time points. Importantly, this also enables the collection of common rare but important adverse outcomes, such as rare side effects. How powerful outcome harmonization can be becomes clear when looking at the example of the EPOC prospective meta-analysis that looked at early childhood obesity prevention. For this PMA, four studies um, learned about each other um, just after acquiring funding independently and decided to collaborate in a PMA. Before they decided to collaborate, um, only two of the 11 um, main outcomes would have been collected by all four, study, uh, by all four studies. So in a traditional meta-analysis, only two of the 11 main outcomes could have been meta-analyzed for all four studies. After the decision to collaborate in a PMA, 10 of the 11 outcomes were collected by all four trials and could be meta-analyzed. So this shows that the decision to collaborate in a PMA strongly increased harmonization of up core outcome categories. Once all studies have been completed, their results can be combined in a meta-analysis. This is often easier than in a retrospective meta-analysis since the outcome collection has been harmonized previously. Reporting guidelines specifically for PMR are currently under development by the PMI methods groups, so watch this space. So, after having walked you through each of the steps of PMA, you may ask yourself, why would I do a PMA compared to a multicenter study? Well, let me tell you the difference between a PMA and a multicenter study. One key difference is that a PMA is usually preceded by systematic search. Whilst multicenter studies usually happen in isolation, Regardless of similar ongoing studies, PMA incorporates and combines all evidence that is currently created to address a certain research question. This also makes a PMA more efficient than a multicenter study, since it combines and adapts currently planned trials to answer additional research questions. A PMA does not require the same protocol for each center, but instead allows study-specific protocol variation and outcomes that are locally relevant making it more flexible. And this can also increase generalizability of the research findings um, due to different protocols. Having said all this, the distinction between a PMA and a multicenter study is not always clear. PMA can in fact be very similar to multicenter studies and they can share many of their advantages. Compared to a retrospective meta-analysis, PMA are less biased, they are more collaborative, and they allow increased harmonization of outcomes, which can increase power. So, to conclude, we live in a time where more data are becoming available exponentially, and new methodologies and trial registration allow better and earlier access to these data. We believe that prospective meta-analysis offer an adaptive, efficient, and collaborative way to combine these data in a less biased way. I hope that the guidance we developed will enable more researchers to successfully use these methodologies. So hopefully, in future scoping reviews, our graph summarizing the number of PMA over time will look something like this. I would like to acknowledge the Cochrane PMA Methods Group, and this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening, and please contact me with any questions you may have.